Can you explain what you meant by the term misconduct? Sure. Again, if I may reemphasize where this report was going, um, it was going to people used to dealing with the legislature. It was going to people within the legislature, specifically to people within the House. <clears throat> um, I have an image of what I believe um, is uh, is what how a member should conduct him or herself, um, and what is deemed appropriate use of state resources by uh, by anybody, an employee or uh, a member, and, and that's what I was looking at. If 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 I saw what in my image and what, asking what you're, what you're thinking, my my take on it was, if a member gets up on the floor and is cursing or whatever, I would view that as inappropriate. That's my view. Some other people may may not view it that way. It's my view of it, and that's how I would report it because I would view that as being misconduct. If I view that somebody was using state resources and shouldn't be. Uh, using state resources for political or personal or whatever use, then I would do that as misconduct. So those are just a couple examples of what I do. And, and the same would go with staff. So you use the term also there, inappropriate. Do you uh, do you use those terms in change of misconduct as inappropriate? It depends on in, it depends on where I would phrase it. But yes, uh, somewhat. It, I think that they can. Your primary task, though, was to determine if there was a uh, misuse of state resources, correct? Correct. And you were investigating the uh, termination of Ben Graham and Keith Allen. Correct. Did your scope extend outside of those two areas? Is misuse of state resources, misconduct in office, and termination, wrongful termination. Um, those are the main focus areas. So misconduct in your mind could be anything from cursing on the state floor to <coughs> taking one. Yes, sir. Very wide yes. range of activity. Yes. <coughs> Now your job is the CEO as the, the, of the finances of the House of Representatives. I'm the CFO, the C Chief, Finan yeah, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, yes. And you report directly to Speaker Cotton. I do. So your investigation then into misconduct is limited to issues related to finance, correct? No. Why would they put you in charge of issues outside of finance? Because not only do I oversee finance, but I oversee human resources. I oversee IT, information systems, our computer systems. I oversee facilities. I see, oversee all the basic administrative functions of the Michigan House of Representatives. I want you to look at uh, Exhibit F. That's this form that you had prepared. Yes, sir. Do you, you have a recollection of that form? Yes, sir. <clears throat> the beginning of this form has a warning at the top. I, uh, I don't know how else to characterize it. A statement or a warning. Yes, sir. Um, did you create that warning? Yes. How did you know what, well, are you an attorney? No. How did you know what words to put into that? 
Your Honor, we're starting to get into some privileged areas again here. Well, let's just, let me ask you this. Did you receive some legal advice on that warning? I don't believe I did. Okay, so that's something that you, as HR, is there a certain <coughs> phrase or term they refer to that warning as? There is not. Hey, again, hey, I was given pretty broad latitude to come up with the questions and to come up with what I was, how I was going to proceed. Um, and a number of people reviewed it, but reviewed it after I wrote it. Okay. Well, let me just ask you this. Let's try and, let me just narrow this a bit. You know, we're not going to be violating an attorney client privilege. Yes, sir. As part of your duties as uh, overseeing HR, you're familiar with various, are you familiar with various rules, case law statutes that, that deal with employees and their rights? I am, yes, sir. And is that how you came up with this? what we'll call a warning? I would honestly say it was from years of experience in dealing with the human resource issues, but I mean this specific issue was unique. Okay. So you didn't go specifically ask the lawyer for help on that? I did not. Okay. Next question. And you gave this warning to everybody who you met with? I did. Did you give it to them verbally or did you uh, give it to them some other way? Verbally and in writing. And when you say in writing, how did you give it to them? Give them a copy of what questions I'd be asking. Did you say to them, here's a copy of the questions I'll be asking? I did. Yes. Is it possible that you uh, maybe did give the warning verbally to some people? No. You're absolutely certain you gave this warning to everyone? Yes. In your mind, what's the significance of the word? <coughs> it's significant uh, to let people... Objection. Relevance. No, I'm going to let him answer because I think this goes to perhaps their state of mind with respect to giving statements and sending to an interview uh, as we talk about 408 and 410. I think this could relate to that. Uh, I'm going to allow the question. It's over here. Could you repeat it one more time, please? Mm -hmm. um, in, in your opinion or in your mind, why were you giving this warning? What did the warning it, mean? It, it meant to me that I was I was letting people know that I was treating everyone the same and that this information may be given to somebody else. It was important for you to provide that warning to them so that they had that understanding. Yes. Uh, because without that warning, would they perhaps be misled into the purpose of your interview? No. They still wouldn't be misled? I don't believe so, but I, I still felt I needed to give that warning. stated that you listened to uh, a number of people, Keith Allen, Josh Klein, Ben Graham, Cindy Gamrat, Todd Kosher. You had interviews with all these people, right? Yes. And additional people as well, right? Yes. And you then judged their credibility uh, and decided who to believe and who not to believe? I had to make some determinations as to the credibility of um, statements made versus evidence provided in audio tape or otherwise in email accounts or what have you. And if there was a conflict, then I'd have to look at that. Did you find Keith Allard and Ben Graham to be trustworthy? Uh, I don't see the relevance. This is speculation. This is an appropriate question. He made his report, but in his report, he obviously there was some some line of trustworthiness in there, but I don't think it's an appropriate question. 
Well, the trial. Finding on the credibility of the witnesses of Allard and Graham and Klein. Well, his report speaks for itself. I think I can figure out who he thought at the time was and wasn't believable if he had that opinion. But, you know, he found it trustworthy. I mean, are we getting close to this lie detector barometer type of argument that Mr. Nichols was vehemently objecting to? I mean, I'm going to read the report, and I've already read through parts of it, so I can't figure out who he believed and didn't believe. Right? So if you, I guess, Mr. DiPerno, I'm going to sustain the objection to the extent if you have a specific question to get to. I understand that might have been foundational. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get to the question? When you had a conversation with the Michigan State Police, yes. did you refer to Keith Allard and Ben Graham as liars? Very possible. Well, you, well, wait a minute. What do you mean very possible? Can I don't know talk? if I used that word. Do you have a report? <clears throat> we have the audio recording that's not been transcribed. We can play it. Can you get right to that part? We can get right to that part. Well, let's get right to that part. Well, let's bring that part up here so I can be sure that we're getting that recorded. Well, let me ask you. Are you offering us to refresh his recollection? I am. All right. Ms. Hart? Your Honor, I think he's offering it to go get around the ruling that you just made. With regard to commenting on the credibility of the other witnesses who already testified. This is different. This is now impeachment because when he writes a report that gets submitted, he obviously drew conclusions to suggest that Ms. Gamrat and or Mr. Corser were not being truthful and, quote, were lying about things. The information he got from some of these folks, Mr. Allward, Mr. Graham, Mr. Klein, you know, he specifically says, you know, that he relied on that, at least with respect to Ms. Gamrat. So now we have an issue where if he, in fact, made a statement during an interview to the state police that he thought they were liars, okay, I mean, that kind of impeaches his own report. I understand that, Judge. And also, I don't want to be taken out of context. I don't know what they're going to play for you, what section is going to be taken out of the recording. You know, I think it's very... Say what? That's a fair point. One, two, three, four. Back room, cue it up, let them hear it. We'll take five minutes. You can step down if you like. Okay. Thank you. I was roughly in on the hot seat. It's okay. Probably don't want to go to law school, do you? Well, I guess it is. I don't know. Legislature, law school. I had the pleasure of doing both. You got to go down to... Oh, you want to do it? Show them around. Thank you. Should take you to the one up there. Why don't you go to the executive one? Just in case we don't get a break. I understand. That's good. What is good is ready. Keep it queued up. We're on potty break. Five minutes. Sorry. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. You know, it's like if you smoke and you go to a restaurant and, you know, if you're waiting on your food, it doesn't come, you light up a cigarette, and the minute you fire up, you bring it. Absolutely. It never fails. You're in there. 
I'm Nicole, intern for uh, Mr. Well, I love my light rating, yeah. <laughs>
the body panels. Conduct by the defendants, correct, and whether or not there was any wrongful termination, correct. Okay. We haven't spoke of the wrongful termination, and we're not necessarily going to, because that does not make up 
any of the charges here. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. Do you recall, sir, whether or not you made any statement uh, that referenced uh, Mr. Graham, Mr. Klein, or Mr. Alworth as to whether or not you thought they were liars or untruthful when you interviewed with the state police? Yes, I believe I did. Okay. Now, would that have been after your report and investigation on the alleged misconduct? My conversation went with the uh, AG and the state police was afterwards. Okay. Now, with respect to the statement about <coughs> thinking they were not truthful or untruthful or liars, whatever term you used, did that, what part of your investigation did that relate to? Related to a number of spectrums, uh, Your well, Honor. Within the context of the three things we identified that you were tasked with investigating. Yes, sir. It mostly had to do with the wrongful termination. Okay. Very good. Did it have anything to do with the misconduct as to the defendants or use of state resources? Uh, no, Your Honor. No. You may proceed. We're not going to get into this wrongful termination. That's the subject of the civil action. Folks, you go propose all you want. You can go make Judge Jamo work and earn the extra pay he gets over me. I'm not litigating that here. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. After you talk to Mr. Corser, um, on this regarding this interview on August 17, 2015, uh, did Mr. Corser ask to make revisions to this document? Yes. Did you allow him to make revisions? Yes. So your your statement is that there's revisions in this that he has made. Yes. Do you know what those revisions? Are? Excuse me. That's as to exhibit F. I do not know if the exact um, changes to those. Uh, I believe Mr. Simon and Ms. Rubel could talk to that better than I could. Um, I do know that he came and made it. I know it wasn't the final version that he wanted, but it was the last one I received. Okay. So is it possible that he wanted additional revisions that are not incorporated? Yes. Is it possible or is it true? Is it? It's possible that there are additional revisions. Do you know for certain that there are additional revisions that need to be made? Since I don't know what they would be, I, I can't speak to that. Is your testimony that those revisions would have been made by Mr. Simon and Ms. Rubel? I don't know if, if Representative Corzer read the revised version, which would have been the version that ended up in the final report, and then wanted to make additional revisions, and if he gave those to him. Now, he did not sign this version, this final version. He did not. Do you know why he didn't sign that version? I do not. Do you, you didn't have a conversation with him about signing the final version? I don't recall that conversation. If someone were to ask Mr. Corser to sign that final version, would it have been you or somebody else? <coughs> if he was making changes to it um, with Doug and Deb, uh, they may have asked him for it. I may have asked him as well. I just don't recall that conversation. Why did you refuse to investigate the allegations regarding the blackmail tax? I believe I well, I thought that that investigation was already happening um, because I was under the impression Representative Corzer had already asked some people to look into that. Um, that's one reason. Um, and I don't have access to that. I did not have access to that phone itself. If you had asked for access, would you have given access? Calls for speculation. 
he's in a, he's that's why I get the meat. Well, he testified that he's in a broad range of meetings in this. Uh, but he also was tasked with doing three things. Misconduct by either of the defendants, misuse of state resources, and wrongful termination. That's the three things that he testified the speaker tasked him with doing. Not into this other thing. And he thought somebody else was doing it. So what he would or wouldn't have done if he had it, if he had the phone, I don't know that that's proper. I'm going to sustain that objection. You state in your report that the blackmail test the blackmail texts have very little relevance to this investigation, correct? Correct. Did you not think that the texts themselves provided some insight as to Mr. Corser's motivation? I honestly can't speak to Representative Corser's motivation. So I don't know. Why did you say that the blackmail text had very little relevance? Because my charge was to say if there was misconduct in office and if there was a misuse of state resources um, and if there was a wrongful termination. I honestly felt that the burner phone or whatever it was called um, was something that people were getting overly focused on and that it wasn't relevant to what I was looking into. If somebody, if I was charged with a different thing, maybe I would have looked at that, but I, that's not what I was charged to do. When you're charged with looking into a person's conduct, uh, are you stating that you don't believe it's relevant to look into their motivation for their conduct? I believe one of the questions I asked Representative Corser was, did you know who the texter was? And, and, it, and when he informed me it wasn't him, then I moved on. Who did he tell you the texter was? He, he did not know. Did he tell you he thought it was Ben Graham? I think he thought it could have been a bunch of people, but he wasn't. He was speculating in that discussion as well. Did you talk to Mr. Corser's Mr. Corser about his state of mind at the time he sent out the false flag email? Or I should correct that when he asked uh, his state of mind at the time he asked Ben Graham send out the false flag. I'm trying to remember if that was part of the interview. I do remember him making statements on it, but I don't know if that was during his uh, committee testimony or if it was during our interview. Um, the focus of our interview on his discussion part was more relative to his employees. Um, he wanted to talk more about his employees during that interview with me. It, is that because you are also investigating the issue of wrongful termination? Yes, I, I believe that is. Would you say the majority of your interview with Mr. Corser involved the issues of wrongful termination? No. Would you say it was split 30, you know, one third, one third, one third? I think the same questions were asked uh, of every person I interviewed, and what that person chose to tell me differed. Uh, Representative Corser spoke a lot about the employees. Now, you did not record the interview with Mr. Corser, did you? Correct. You decided instead of recording, you wanted to have people take notes. Correct. Did you have a discussion with Speaker Cotter about whether you should record these interviews or take notes? I'm going to object to that line of question. It kind of rolls right into with the issues with Speaker Cotter. I think well, it, it does, but... Mr. Department. 
I think it goes directly to the instructions he's been given as from the speaker Congress to what the scope of his investigation is. I, I also have some concern if a lawyer was present during any of these meetings. Like, if what? If a lawyer was present during any of these conferences. Somebody can ask, but not you. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. uh, did you have a conversation? I want to allow it to the extent that this is in one of those areas where you know we have this issue on appeal as to what uh, the attorneys for Speaker Carter think he can and can't testify to. Uh, we can flush some of those things out now. I'm sure it'll assist, you know, circuit court. But I guess the question is fair. Is it, did you ever have a conversation with Speaker Carter as to whether or not you should record these conversations? No. This was solely your idea, not to. I. Um, Please testify. Yes, sir. Oh. Did you tell Mr. Corder, Mr. Corser, that Speaker Connor was the chief officer of the uh, of the House of Representatives, and that he ultimately had uh, would make the decision as to whether there was misconduct? Very likely. Is that your understanding of Speaker Cotter's role, is to determine whether misconduct occurs? Um, Speaker Cotter, any speaker, is the chief executive officer of the House of Representatives. That is true. It is up to the membership as a whole to determine um, whether uh, whether there's misconduct. So did you tell Mr. Corser that the decision on whether there was mis misconduct rides with the speaker or did you tell him that the decision rides with the house? I may have told him both. Did you have a discussion with Mr. Corser about the evening of May 19, 2015? Yes. And that's the evening that Ben Graham went to Mr. Corson's law office, correct? Correct. Did Mr. Corson explain to you that he believed that Ben Graham came to his office as a friend that evening? Yes, he did. Uh, I think we're walking into hearsay that the report speaks for itself and notes speak for themselves. I don't believe these are questions that uh, can be answered by uh, this witness. Well, I think to the extent he can, he can give an answer. If he knows he's already answered the question, apparently this is what he was told by Mr. Corser. Uh, as to the report, I'm not sure what report that's in because, you know, you folks got to remember, you all have had the benefit of eating, sleeping, drinking these reports for a significant period of time, and I haven't opened a can yet. Mr. Ryder, when it's coming from this witness as opposed to Mr. Corser, wouldn't it be your son? But he said this is what Mr. Corser told him. He's not a party opponent. I, whatever. Where are we going? Well, I'm going to the issue of uh, the discussion, which relates, I think, directly to the elements of misconduct as to the, 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 the witness's understanding of Ben Graham's involvement on May 19th and why some things are in the report and other things are not. But I don't think he can testify as to what Mr. Porcher said because it's, he's not, Mr. Mr. Porcher if he wants to have that out there, he doesn't, doesn't come through Mr. Bolin. It comes through the report. We can introduce those statements because we're party opponents, but they cannot. Well, I'm confused then. Is the, the report is admitted as evidence? Um, am I not an object? What's that? I don't believe there was an objection. We objected to having the report entered. You said it was in. Well, that's my question then. If we got the report in, well, but Mr. I, I can ask questions, can't I? Well, you can ask questions of what he did with respect to the report. 
I think their issue is you can't ask questions, but what did Mr. Corsa say to you about why Mr. Graham came to his house if it's not in the report? I haven't read the report, so I don't know if it's in the report or not. Okay, now I can stop right now. We can just end for the day, and I can go read all this stuff and see you guys tomorrow. I'm sorry, next week. Okay, but I'm saying, you know, you got to remember, you kind of got me at a disadvantage. So, I'll, I mean, I'll hear more argument on it, but I'm just saying, right now, that answer is in. It's on the record. So now we're going to be looking to where we are in the future with these kind of questions. So we'll take the argument. Well, the argument is uh, Rule of Evidence 106, which states that when a writing or a recorded statement or a part thereof is introduced by a party, an adverse party may require the introduction um, of any other part or any other writing or record statement which ought and fairness be considered contemporaneously with the way. You're not asking for any other record or recorded statement. Is there in is it any of the notes from the interview of Mr. Corsa that he said he thought Ben Graham came as a friend, for example? Um, let me consult with my Six says when a writing or recorded statement or part thereof is introduced by a party, an adverse party may require the introduction at that time of any other part or any other writing or recorded statement which ought in fairness to be considered contemporaneously with it. Now that wasn't offered at the time, but that's okay. So do you have some other writing or report? Because that's what it talks about. It doesn't talk about asking him questions. It says, maybe in time of any other part or any other writing or recording, recorded statement. So is there a writing or recorded statement that you want entered with this report that's not already here? Because we have the notes. The uh, people were taking notes at Mr. Bowling's request. We have uh, the answers of this other exhibit, which is F, that Mr. Corser had an opportunity to uh, make corrections to. Understanding, of course, he didn't apparently couldn't make all the corrections he wanted, and uh, that's I don't know why that is. Other than the other thing I understand is Mr. Bowler was not going to allow either Mr. Corser or Ms. Gamrat to make or to give, quote, additional testimony in this uh, this form questions they were asked. They could make some statements like, why, or correction, like, why well, I didn't say this, or I said, uh-huh, and that should have been no, or uh-huh, actually meant yes. Those kind of things they could do. But I don't know where we are with, we're going to ask him questions, because if you got a recorded statement, you put it in, where he said this. Or if you got a written report, he said it, let's put it in. But we're not going to, I don't, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not real comfortable with us going back and forth on this this way. Can I reserve on that issue? Sure, absolutely. Reserve is good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sustain it. Well, I'll take it under advisement at this time. But let's, let's go on to a different issue. You were aware um, during your interview with Mr. Corser that there was a <coughs> recorded statement made from uh, a recording of that meeting on May 19th, correct? Correct. <coughs> did you, did you, were you taking the position with, with respect to your report that Ben Graham was uh, at Mr. Corser's office as a state employee. I'm sorry, what was the question? With respect to this report, was was the witness um, 
were you writing this report with the understanding that Ben Graham was at Mr. Corser's law firm as a state employee or as a friend? Well, let me ask you, did it matter to you? Actually, no. Okay, next question. <clears throat> There, uh, because this this goes, I believe, is count four. He solicited a state employee to send out this false email. But, Your Honor, it doesn't mean it's not relevant whether Mr. Boland thought he was a state employee there or he was a friend. That's that's Mr. Boland's opinion. It doesn't go to the element. Well, but it well, if that's the case, then I guess you better bring your detective in because somebody made the determination that Mr. Graham was there in his capacity as a state employee. Yeah, and Graham, and Mr. Graham already, hmm? Mr. Graham already testified that uh, he was there, he was working uh, for um, Mr. Corser, and that he was afraid not to go because he was working for Mr. Corser. I mean, those are all things that you need to take into consideration. But Mr. Boland's opinion does not have any shed any light on that, and I think it's, it's not relevant. This takes time.
allow me to put some additional argument on with regard to the factual part of it? No? Nope. I'm ready to rule. We're back on the record of the matter of the state of Michigan versus Gamrat and Corser or Corser and Gamrat. The <coughs> The court has received, I understand the fact over objection, the People's Exhibit 9C, which is a report on the investigation of alleged misconduct by Representative Ty Corson and Representative Cindy Gamblin. That report, as I previously stated, contains the, what I would frankly term a preliminary investigation by Mr. Bowles to determine if anything happened. He was then to send it on and send it forward. Based on the interviews he conducted that were not recorded and, frankly, did not include sworn testimony or statements, he authored a report that contained his opinions based upon that. Uh, the issue here is it relates to count four as to the defendant, of course, or only relates to whether or not or not it's come up in terms of what capacity he thought. Mr. Graham was present or responded to the call to go to Mr. Corser's law office the evening of May 19, 2015. The defense argues that Rule 106 permits this and that it goes to the capacity in which Mr. Graham thought he was there. Mr. Graham testified, as I recall, looking through my notes, he received this call from Mr. Corser. He went, and I know there was some extended discussion about, you know, not responding to your boss. He went there, as he thought, as a state employee. He also testified uh, that he asked to meet with the speaker's chief of staff and Brock Schwartzel on what he was being asked to do. So it's clear that Mr. Graham at least thought, felt, he went there in his capacity as a state employee. If he went as a friend, he might have called a neighbor or someone else. I don't think he'd be trying to talk to the speaker's chief of staff or Brock Schwartz. Number two, and I think more importantly, uh, Rule 106 is commonly known as the rule of completeness. It permits opposing counsel to require introduction of other portions of writings or recordings or even other relevant writing or recordings. This is to prevent 
uh, matters being taken out of context, and secondly, uh, so that you know in those areas where opposing counsel cannot effectively cure through later introduction some missing evidence or prejudice that's created. The problem you have, Mr. DiPerno, is that this rule pertains only to writings or recordings. Okay. There's no writing or recording. You're basically asking the witness what his subjective opinion was as to why he was there. 106 does not require that. It does not allow for that. The objection is sustained. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, right may we uh, quickly approach on a completely separate issue? Not really? Yeah, you know, really. we got 45 minutes left. You guys don't want to come back tomorrow. Come on up. I have to be here. In the afternoon. No. We're going to do some dates. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. Housekeeping may always appreciate it. All right. Let's proceed, Mr. Deferno, uh, with that in order. operated a business out of Mr. Corson's law firm. Sir, I, I don't understand the relevance of this question. Well, I'll let him ask it. Yes. Do you understand that Mr. Graham kept desks, personal computers, items of that type at Mr. Corson's law firm? I was unaware of what was kept there. Same objection. Do you have a continuing objection? You know, Ms. Hart, we'll spend more time arguing over whether or not it's admissible. Uh, you know. Thank you. I'll let him ask. You know, like I said, everybody figure out. I know what I'm doing. Okay. Did, um, During your investigation, did you de determine whether or not uh, Mr. Graham or Mr. Corser kept any state or HBO uh, furniture or equipment at Mr. Corser's law firm? I don't believe I asked that question, no. If I may. Um, add to that a little bit. I, I did ask Representative Corser about his laptop um, that was a uh, house furnished laptop. <clears throat> did you come to understand that uh, Ben Graham had a key to Mr. Corser's law firm? No. You didn't know that? No. Did you check Mr. Graham's time card to determine whether or not he had filled out a time card related to the evening of May 19th. I reviewed time cards as, uh, as part of this investigation. Yes. Was there a notation in the time card that he had been working the night of May 19th? Our time cards don't quite work that way. Um, it's whether you're uh, working as a W or on vacation as a V. Um, we wouldn't reflect uh, hours past normal working hours. So if you're, if you were asking me about the 
seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock time frame, or whatever that was, um, that wouldn't be reflected in the time. So state employees don't have to keep track of time. And time out. Legislative employees. <coughs> Here, I don't know what Ms. Townsend and Ms. Hart do, but let's talk about what they do in the legislature. I understand. Uh, legislative employees that are within your control, which includes Mr. Grant, correct? Um, they, he does not have to account for his time after five o'clock. No, sir. Our normal work hour is nine to five. What if somebody doesn't work in the day? They just want to work at night. Um, we would have to get some extenuating circumstances in order for that to be approved, and that was not really <coughs> in this case. But what if, for example, the workstations here in Lansing, let's say they got to go do work in the district in Ironwood. They leave at 6 in the morning, they get there, or well, let's say you know, somewhere near the UP, and they get back at uh, 8 o'clock at night. Yes, sir. It's just a dub. Yes, sir. Okay, that's just. That's all it is. Tough rocks. Exactly. That's how I remember it. <coughs> Did you have any reservation when you learned that Mr. Graham had reported this meeting on May 9th? Me pause, I guess, uh, but I don't know what you mean by reservation. Why did it cause you pause? Um, I think people recording other people, I, I, uh, I just uh, I'm uncomfortable with that because it uh, doesn't feel like it's not honest to you. I'm sorry to keep objecting. This is way outside the relevant <coughs> realm of this line of questioning. Did it give you any concern as to this credibility as you saw it in terms of what you were doing? Let's oh. strike that. Let me answer this. Yes. Did it give you pause because the guy's recording his boss surreptitiously? Yes. You wonder if you were being recorded? Always. <laughs> Well, for the record, you are in here. I know. Yes. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Ben, Multiple. <laughs> yes. If Ben Graham was an employee of the state, did it not cause you any concern that the state had ownership of that recording? That Mr. Graham did it as an agent of the state of Michigan? You know, I'm not objecting yet. The question is not, it's, it's not relevant, it's not um, appropriate, and it's making an assertion against Mr. Graham that he was using maybe state equipment, or it's just it's not a relevant question. I think it's directly relevant to, number one, the investigation, or to the report, which discusses the tape recording, uh, which talks about Ben Graham employee, but if he's there as an agent of the state and court, the state has to take ownership of that. Well, you can brief that for me, okay? I'm not going to accept that. I have a micro cassette recorder I had in private practice I still have, so if I go out here and record something, I don't think that belongs to the court. I mean, we don't know what equipment the gentleman used. The gentleman said uh, that he was in communications or uh, Political consulting of some type. I would assume they got a tape recorder. I don't know whose equipment to use. I'm not going to make that leap, Mr. Confirmer. Okay, and, and, and let me be honest, even if it was, how does that affect my ability to determine probable cause in this matter? Because I don't think it does. Well, I'm still trying to hit on the element of whether Mr. Graham was there as a state employee. Well, but this isn't a witness. The witness for that would be Mr. Graham. That he's not the witness. He doesn't know what he was there for. All he knows, he calls the guy in for an interview, 
pursuant to the charge he's given by Speaker Cotter. He's asking him questions. The guy pulls out a tape recording and says, you know, here I recorded this. Okay, if he didn't ask him, and it's not reflected in his report, then that's a question for you to ask Mr. Graham. It is reflected in the report. Well, Mr. Graham has already testified. Okay, Mr. DePerno, I'm not going to let you basically impeach or try to impeach Mr. Graham through this witness who, with all due respect, wouldn't know. Well, I'm not. And you're asking him to draw conclusions that he wouldn't know. No, I'm closing the door on that. Let's move on. Did you come to understand that there had been other conversations taped in the state offices by Mr. Graham? Yes. So those tapings were done on state time, correct? In a state office by Mr. Graham? Correct. If they're recorded in the state office on state time, doesn't the state have ownership of those tapes? There's the same objection. These are direct, these are very different. Where are you trying to go with this? I'm trying to deal with the element of whether or not Ben Graham was there as a state employee. And the report makes that determination. It says, Representative Corsair's request of a state employee. Let me ask you. Why did you reference him as a state employee in your report? Very honestly, at the beginning of orientation, Judge, I tell all members at orientation about when they hire a political person or a friend, those people are deemed state employees, house employees. And so that's the reference. Okay, let's move on. Are they state employees 24 hours a day? Legislative employees work odd hours. And in my mind, you don't, when you control somebody's paycheck, you don't make that distinction. He's a state employee. Mr. DiPerno, you're a lawyer, right? I am. And when you go home and you're planting flowers in your backyard, you're still a lawyer, aren't you? Yeah, you are. Yeah, sure. Okay. If I'm playing golf or if I'm at a club or I'm out to dinner or I'm doing whatever, I'm still a judge as much as I may hate that. And being recognized as that, okay, you are what you are. He's a state employee, period. Okay. We need to move on because this isn't helping me. It's not doing much for me. Mr. Witness testified that he's a state employee up until the time he, up until normal business hours. No, he said they're work hours. He said they're work hours. It's W or V. He also said when I asked him, if you work for a legislator, you've got to go to Ironwood and you leave here at 5 o'clock in the morning and you get back here at 8 o'clock at night, that's just a W. You're working. Tough rocks. Work for somebody that has an office closer, a district closer. He's a state employee. Let's move on. What evidence did you have that Mr. Corser forced a staff member 
you forge a signature on the back of the How to do that? I believe Mary went through all this. I could be wrong, but I think he was asking the answer. Cross-exam. I'll let him answer. At the Bubax, um, we had the original signature of Representative Corsa that he gave to the clerk at orientation, and we had the testimony of the employees. <coughs> And that's the, let's talk about the testimony of evidence that you have. And specifically to the issue that they were, those employees were forced to sign a blue bag. Uh, what's your definition of the word force? They didn't do it on their own, they were made to do it. Okay. As simply as requesting an employee to do something? Uh, it could be that simple if it's something in violation of a rule, I guess. Can an employee say, no, I don't want to do that to their boss? They could say that, right? I don't know if it's that simple, but again, when you hold a paycheck over an employee, especially one that has a young child and everything, I think it's a little, a little more difficult than that. Did that happen here? Did someone hold a paycheck over someone? Do you have any evidence that took place? No, sir. I'm not saying that when a job. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. This is an at will position? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, so that question related to testimonial evidence. You didn't have any physical evidence either, did you? A physical evidence. Forced. No, sir. But you chose to use that word forced, correct? You went with a conscious decision. Yes. And you were trying to convey something with that word, weren't you? Yes. What were you trying to convey? Now that you've said that you don't have any actual testimony or physical evidence that they were forced, why did you decide to use that word? Again, I think I do have evidence and as far as the blue bag goes and as far as the signature page goes and as far as the testimony given by the employees. I use the word forced because I understand how people feel about their job in the legislature. With all due respect, Your Honor, be it at will or not, um, you know, when you have to feed your family, you do sometimes what your boss tells you you have to do. Would your opinion change if you learned that uh, Mr. Klein testified that he wasn't actually told by Mr. Corsa to sign a blue bag? That he inferred that uh, from some conversations? I don't know that, that was, uh, that's the correct uh, characterization. Cross-examination. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for what Mr. Klein said, so I don't know. Well, if you learned that he, that his testimony was that he was not directly told by Mr. Corsa to sign that blue bag, but that he inferred that from conversations, would that change the force of your statement? I don't believe so, because the inference could be that strong. But you didn't, from what half, what was it in your investigation that you understood, there, did you understand there was an inference? No, I was under, you know, the understanding and the testimony is that they were made to. So it was pretty, it was a lot stronger than the word inference. So your, your testimony is that even an inference that somebody interprets to mean to sign a blue bag is just as powerful as being directly asked to do it. I think it can be, yes. Now, you had stated in your testimony regarding Mrs. Gamrat that if, if you learned that uh, Joshua Klein uh, stated that he was not directly told by Ms. Gamrat to sign, that that would change your opinion. But in this, now you're not willing to do that in terms of Mr. Corson. Um, uh, you're right, I'm not. 
Is that because you have to hold some animosity towards Mr. Corson? No, I didn't believe so. Then why would you be unwilling to change your why would you change your opinion for one but not for another? <clears throat> because of the testimony of the employees um, was a stronger relative to Mr. Corson. How was it stronger relative to Mr. Corson? By their references as to what you know what he was asking them to do. What is your understanding of the uh, You know who De Detective Britvac is? I don't know. I, I may have met the person by that name. To be very honest, I don't. You don't know. He's a well. He's a detective with the Michigan State Police. But did you ever have occasion to meet him during this uh, investigation? Uh, I'm going to be very honest. I, the name. I may have. I. You don't know if he was involved in any of these interviews you had with any of these uh, staff members, Mr. Corson, Mr. Cameron. I'm being very honest. Remembering those names right now is a little bit. Were there any state police officers in any of the interviews you had with either Cindy Cameron or Mr. Corson? Oh, in my interview, yes. Um, no, there were not. No state police. No. So you couldn't tell us. Thank you. 
before Ms. Hart we get up, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Bolin, I asked you about this part in your report where you indicate that there was testimony of physical evidence that uh, Representative Corsa and Gamrat forced their staff to forge their signatures. And you indicated the testimony of evidence came from uh, Mr. Klein, Mr. Graham, and Mr. Allen. Graham, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> if I were to tell you that Mr. Graham testified yesterday that he was not present for any conversation about blue bag signing, would that change your opinion based on your report? He was not present with me? He was not present with them during any conversation about blue bag signing. Um, I may have been more, if, if I would have known that, I may have been more specific as to who they requested to do that. Yes, sir. Any redirect, Ms. Hart? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Wow. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, somebody said something this morning about a stimulation that was short enough today. I see I four questions didn't do much. So I thought you said wait. I no, no, no. Wow. I only really try. Okay. Um, I would like to refer you guys to um, 9C. Um, Judge, can I give him that exhibit, please? People looked at 9C. I'm looking at page five of nine. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to number three, which is close to the top. Yes. Well, well three. Um, Mr. Nichols asked you several questions with regard to um, the uh, your interview with Ms. Gamrat. And I was very confused um, after his questioning with whether or not um, she stated to you, that you sh and which you did not believe, that she did not have any knowledge of the email. Is that what that says? She had no knowledge of the email? Correct. Uh, what about having any knowledge of the content of the email? Correct. She denied that she had knowledge of either of those two things. Until she learned them from the report. The reporter on, on the house floor or whatever. Okay, and then you stated that... The question to be clarified because the whole thing to me is did she unequivocally object me? I don't think it's that unclear. Apparently she indicated she didn't have any knowledge of the email or its content until the report from her. Now that's the way I understand the testimony. That's the way I understand the report. Knowledge of the email and its content? Is that what you said? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Point a little bit. Um, we're talking about, about signatures, uh, bills, etc. Does the House provide a digital signature for the uh, representatives, or is there some digital signature use that you're aware of at the House? Not. We already covered that. Uh, I don't believe we covered it with Mr. Bond, I thought I did. I thought it was with, uh, with uh, Mr. Randall. I'm sorry, you're right. But if it's, yeah. that's, you can ask the question. Are you aware of those any digital signatures that they use from the house, whether issued by the house <coughs> itself or the staffers? There are. Uh, they're used on members' letters, for members' letters. So the IT department gives them that for purposes of signing multiple letters. Okay. And so it wouldn't be unusual that that could be used by any kind of staffers or things that be at besides the bank bills, correct? What do you mean, other than? Other than the bank bills. Uh, electronic signatures could be used on a number of things. And those could be done by the staffers if the particular legislator agrees? If the legislator gives them access to that. Um, what's there, now you designed the, the outline for which everybody was asking questions, correct? Correct. You wrote that, you authored it? Yes. So when you asked people to take notes, yes. um, 
were they taking notes just as to the questions on the outline? Were they following the outline and that's where they're writing, they were writing notes? If you know? They were following the outline as people were responding to my questions. And if there was anything that was not on your outline that was talked about, was that added into the notes? Yes, you know? quite, yes because quite often, um, you know, the, some people wanted to go in different directions. <coughs> Was there, was there any questions with regard to the uh, false flag email that was included in your outline? There was not. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Defense counsel both, I believe, asked you about the warning that you gave that you read that was on, on the outline when people came in to give you information. Um, and you said that you had done that to um, ensure that they knew what, they were gonna be, what was going to be happening with this information, correct? Correct. Okay, and would you, in your opinion, and why you did that because, would you have done that because you wanted that to be a formal type of a setting, so to speak? That is definitely one of the reasons, and, and if I may say, I viewed it more as a statement than a warning because I wanted people to be informed. I wasn't trying to warn them of anything. I was trying to inform them of of what I was doing and what I was asking them. So if people came in to have a meeting in your office, you wouldn't necessarily have them sign that type of statement or Correct. read that type of statement I to them? Definitely would not. You were asked about um, Joe Gamrat. You said that you contacted him two times. Correct. And did you actually speak with him? I did. And uh, he just didn't come in or told you he wasn't going to come in? Well, how did that happen? He never first, appeared. He did not. The first conversation was he would have to think about it. And the second conversation was that he was going to att attempt to rearrange his schedule. And, you never and then he never did. Okay. Um, would those questions have had anything to do with this extortion uh, claim that the uh, defendants have been asking you to look at? I was just trying to get to any relevant information to my task at hand, quite honestly. And if part of that was uh, on the emails and what caused them, that would have been a plus. Um, but it really was to try to get to the to the root of it, his name had been brought up by a number of people, and I just thought if somebody was referencing him in their testimony, I should bring that person in to tell their side of it. And you already testified that, in fact, there was no law enforcement present during your um, interviews with these individuals? Correct. correct. And um, you have no authority to charge anybody in any type of criminal um, charge, do you? I do not. And you've already testified that one of your tasks was to find whether or not there was misconduct in office. Is that correct? Correct. And, and when we say misconduct in office, it's based on the standards of the House of Representatives, not with regard to criminal charges? Right. Okay. Not kind of a question Well, you know, I have just given you all a whole lot of rope. So I'm not going to stop it today. I'll take the answer. I was trying to outline misconduct as I saw it, and then it would be up to the members to determine um, how that was going to be handled from there. I do not set that standard. Members set that standards for themselves. Um, we've already talked a lot about having days off and taking days off and the way in which they're reported, which, by the way, I would like to apply to our office as well. So I speak to you think about that. Somebody help me. Uh, were you aware that um, that Ben Graham took filing day off at the uh, direction of the funding course? Yes.
I have no further questions, Your Honor. One final question, Mr. Bowen. This statement that was given, a warning, did you have anybody sign off on it? Or initial or acknowledge that they understood all these and wanted to go ahead and continue their conversation? Begin the conversation after I read that? Yes. No, sir. All right. Well, Mr. Bowen. Yes, sir. You get a W for the day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. May the witness be excused. Yes, Your Honor. With a W. With a W. Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. You're excused from further proceedings. Thank you. On the exam stage, I'll take that exhibit if you don't mind. It is 449. My guess is we don't have a quick witness. We have some other witnesses. Mr. Chandler. Right. Yes. That's the only thing that can be. Hold your horses. Yes. You have two other witnesses, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And you may have some other witnesses. All right. Here's what we're going to do. I saw Mr. Ellsworth here, but he left. We're going to continue this exam. We're going to take it. We're going to go as far as we can. Okay. We're not going to wait for circuit court to do what they're going to do. We're going to go as far as we can here. I have some dates for us to come back. I personally like mornings. We start at 1 30. We're probably going to go to 8. I didn't get a W for that, too. Well, actually, we won't. Somebody's looking at me cross-eyed over here. Actually, from both sides. We have 10 30 next Tuesday, June 2nd, or we could all really take a break and look at 8 30 a.m. Tuesday, June 14th. That flight deck? Yeah. Our position is that June 14th would be good. Do we check with our witnesses? I have no problem with that. I haven't checked with the witnesses. Well, no, we're going to bring them in. They work for the state. It's a W. Can I bring them in, Judge? I'm going to let them know the date. I'll continue their subpoenas until that date. If you guys want to give your witnesses some more paper, that's up to you. Get them here. But I'm going to let those that are here know what the date is. Mr. Nichols, I take it that's okay with your calendar? I'll make it work. Thank you. Mr. DiPerno? Right now, it's okay. Good. Then that's it. Bring those witnesses in. The other two, whoever witnesses are out there, bring them back in. Mr. Nichols, I'm going to tell your folks. Friday, they're going to be after. 14th. Back after. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
we'll do. We put them on call an hour and a half so that we know where we are. I don't want them sitting around the hallway for five or six hours waiting around for three hours because we could be out doing something else. Okay. So, sir, you're going to be on a 90-minute call. The two of you should be here at 9 o'clock. You may or may not get an additional subpoena or paper from uh, the person subpoenaing you. If you do, great. If you don't, I just told you, we're going to give you a notice of that. As a reminder, Mr. Shannon, uh, you're here representing uh, the two house employees, and I believe you check your calendar and you can be here too? Yes, I can, and I'll just add to that that both of them work across the street, and so it should not be a problem to call either of them over on short notice. Very good. Okay. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Once. No. Twice. No, Your Honor. We're adjourned. Thank you. So let's get you noticed and then you're all set to uh, all right, all right. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry about y'all waiting out here in the hallway.